What we have here is Mr. Walter Ziegler from uh, South Carolina who served aboard the uh, USS Tappahanna. And uh, what I'm going to do is just ask a few little questions about his time aboard the ship and what kind of job he did and this sort of thing as well, okay? How many years did you serve in the Navy? From August of uh, 1965 until August of 69. Okay, and your rate was? Bosa mate third class. All right, uh, t t explain what a bosa mate really does in relation to uh, a, fleet, a fleet oiler like this. Uh, what he does is uh, you got like second division back here and first division up here, and I, and I was in first division. We take care of all the uh, riggings and all the painting and the, keeping the decks clean and all the rigging. It's like a, just a big rigger. At the time of uh, replenishing at sea, what, what were your duties at that time? Uh, I had different time. I had different jobs. One of the uh, like these hoses. Uh, there's a cable that comes from that hose that goes to the ship. And the hose slide down. Use the, uh, the, the cable by itself was called the uh, span wire, and it's got to be on there so the hose can slide down to the ship to hook up the oil. Uh, what we're talking about here is that uh, these two ships are side by side, like you see on the photograph on the other side here. And you start out by how did the first line you get across? How do, how did they get that line across? It's called a shot line. You either use a bolo. Or to shoot it with a gun. That's right. Which is a little small line. Right. Then you attach a little bit of larger line to that one. That, and keep pulling. And you keep pulling, and then finally you get a wire cable. That's right. Yeah. I used to be on the other end, so I, I can remember <laughs> that as well. I'll have to tell you a story about that a little later on as well. Now, you went aboard the ship at what point? Uh, the ship was uh, had just come out of a... Uh, Mothball? It came out of mothballs, and I guess the ship went to Algiers, Louisiana. And they got a bunch of crew and the sons all to Norfolk to go through school. Then we had to go to the ship and finish up what they were doing. So we bring it in commission. At the time, so it wasn't in commission when you went aboard. Uh, so at the time you went aboard, you lived aboard, but most of the crew was still living in barracks? No, they all, they all finally came on to live. Okay. I and see. then it came in commission. And how long after commission you did a shake it down cruise? The only shake it down cruise we did was when we went from Algiers to Long Beach. And that was it. Through the Panama Canal. Through the Panama Canal and we stopped off the coast of uh, Mexico, dropped anchor, and stayed there for a couple of days and then we pulled in anchor and took off again to Long Beach. Did you have a swim call? Uh, swim? Let me tell you about swim call. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted a swim call. That was my dream. But the dream never came until the last tour. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you the captain's name because I really forgot his name. But he had a swim call, and I wanted to be the first one to go in in the water, but I lost out. So I had a man that little motor whale boat. You put a little boat in the water before they dropped anchor. And on that boat, you got you guys with M1s and Thompsons and 45s in case sharks came around. But uh, what it was, uh, the ship was, the current was two knots. And the captain said, we'll do two knots into this current, which sounded good. But when those guys hit the water and they came up, the ship was gone. But that was like uh, eight knots, uh, four knots. So uh, anyway, that was a disaster. And you usually had a gunner's mate that would have the uh, M1s. Not really. Most of mate, gunners mate. Okay, all right, all right. So that as well. So you 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 do your thing. You go to Long Beach, and that's when you did the first Westpac cruise. Well, then came San Diego because you got to go through all the training again. Okay, I got you. The war games and fire drills and damage control training and all kinds of stuff. Talk about <clears throat> uh, talk about when you uh, you go through the Panama Canal and you're traveling your, up toward Long Beach. Was it a case of constant drills and training and stuff like that? Just going through a little mandatory stuff, but nothing serious like when we got to San Diego. That's the, that's the real training. I swear it really picked up right, right there for you, so that as well. How did the ship operate? Was it in pretty good shape? Yes, sir. Good shape. Engines? The engine had a good crew, good shape. The first crew was the best crew. 
because they call it the Happy Tappy, and that's the way they were. But then again, the name got changed. They quit calling it the Happy Tappy. I got you. They call it the Galloping Ghost of the Vietnam Galloping Coast. Galloping Ghost, yeah. We see, we see, we see that uh, over there. When the first it was the Happy Tappy. Bunch of good guys, all, all of them. And how well did you know Jim Johnson aboard ship? I, I knew him, but not very well because he was in a different section. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Johnson is the uh, individual who donated a uniform and other items to the uh, uh, to the museum, and who I made first contact with at that particular time. Uh, were most of your officers uh, were they uh, were they uh, career officers? Most of them, most of them. Yeah, uh, we we talked a little bit about your commanding officer. He is his full rank was that of a captain. He was a full captain. Right. And one of the two that you said was what we call an Airedale. He was a pilot or something like that. And what actually was happening is that uh, these guys had to uh, have a command at sea before they could make admiral. So what oftentimes you would have, you would have a, uh, a full Navy captain, that would be an 06 rank, and uh, that would be their sea command, even though they had been to sea before, but they weren't in command of the ship or anything like that. Maybe an air squadron, for example. And it was quite common for a commanding officer of a, uh, an oiler or ammunition ship or something like that to be a full Navy captain, but that would be his first sea command. Normally, the, uh, the line officers, they would have sea command as a lieutenant commander or as a commander or something like that as well. Tell us about uh, replenishing at, at sea at, at night. Uh, my recollection is it seemed like when you're in the Western Pacific is that uh, we did most of them at night, and if there was a rain squall within 50 miles, they found a way to get into that rain squall, so everybody got wet. <laughs> well, you get wet. <laughs> but at night, it's actually dangerous because you've got to go by just a couple of lights, a couple of red lights, for instance. If you're in a war zone, you don't want to light the whole ship up. That's right. So you got you just got to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Each person got his job, and you just got to do the job. Uh, explain, explain to the, uh, how these ships now they, they, they're side by side and, 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 and what's involved with that. Well, you got two ships side by side, and some would be rocking this way and the other would be rocking the other way. And keep, you got to keep the lines tight, keep the hoses out of the water. And it's just a, you're kind of weird on the middle way. Did, did you ever, were you ever <coughs> on deck during a breakaway? Oh yeah. You have to explain what we're talking about a breakaway. When the one ship will, will lose uh, steering and just, and it's going to be done real fast. Like when the uh, the repos hit us. They didn't break away, they came at us. <laughs> and they just. What, what, what was this again? The repos. Hospital ship? Okay. It, it put us in dry up. Because <clears throat> they hit right here. It took this whole rig down. Their anchor caught that shroud bar and just snatched everything down. He's talking about the repos, R-E-P-O-S-E, -E, which is a hospital ship, and it actually, uh, is anyone hurt? Not, not serious, except the ship. Matter of fact, we had to fix two band-aids for it. You go in port there. Two big, long camels, band-aids. They look good. Uh, much of the chagrin, I guess, of probably the hospital ship because of some, 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 some of that as well. Uh, did you ever break away where the hose broke and the oil went everywhere? Well, if, if, if it's fast, uh, sometimes the fins come loose, yeah, you just spray all. Yeah. And guys can't shut it down quick enough. Yeah. It just takes a while to shut it down. On that subject, <clears throat> how, um, how much tolerance do you have? The normal distance between the ships is what? And how far apart can they be before it breaks away? Well, let's say that uh, you see these hoses with the, with the loops in it. When those loops get smaller and smaller, you've got to get ready to shut it down. It's like a big old rubber band. That's why you always keep good loops on them. So when ships start going too far away, as those hoses tighten up and the loop comes up, you get ready to have a, yeah. have a mess. Yeah. And I've seen some ships come in so close, from here to that glass door there, you know, just how the water is, just how they do it. They just come back and forth, in and out, swaying back and forth. 
It's like an ultra guy doing the sim. That's the way it is. You've got to stay up with him. Yeah. It's like a big song going on. Now, if the, uh, if the oiler was full, it's sitting low in the water and it's not rocking as much as I, the destroyer escort, which is alongside it, and it's, it's constantly rocking. And what actually has to happen is the, the, uh, the ships put on their very best helmsman. And a very good helmsman, he can almost anticipate which way that ship is going to roll or something like that. And, they, and so you're sitting there and they actually have to maintain exact speed, not even a half a knot difference is they're going side to side like this. And what actually happens from the, uh, this ship here, sometimes they replenish it on both sides at the same time. And then when you have the, uh, like the smaller ships, the 10 cams, they will be lined up four or five deep waiting to go alongside with one another. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> and if you have a junior captain, well, you're at the end of the line, so you could you could bright get a doze a little bit and wait till your turn or something like that. But these guys on the on the order, they 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 don't have a chance to rest because they're constantly refueling. As soon as they finish one, they pull in the hoses, start the whole process again. When the next ship gets in there, how long does it take between the time the ship comes up beside you and you get your Good question? Good question. I'm going to tell you, lady. It's like this. <laughs> <clears throat> One time, my aircraft, an aircraft carrier came along the side. I like to see the Enterprise. Now, that's a nuclear carrier, right? So it, it don't need fuel, but it takes on enough fuel to uh, replenish its ships with. <clears throat> so you got to take on a lot of fuel. We had one stay alongside for 24 hours. And in 24 hours, uh, his escort made two or three passes on the other side of the key. Top it off. So it's just, it's, it's no set time. Right. Just depends on how big the ship is. Okay. But an aircraft carrier, a nuclear, it, he, he's also a tanker. But he carries a lot of fuel. Wow. Even though he don't use it. And explain the difference in the, what types of fuel here that we talked about before here. That, uh, up, up front would be uh, aviation fuel. Back here would be uh, Black Hole and JP-5. More like diesel fuel. And the aviation fuel, that's the one that's the most dangerous. Yeah, on the aviation fuel, uh, you can only use brass screwdrivers, brass hammers, brass wrenches, no steel. Because the slightest spark <coughs> can set it off there. Yeah. So, so, so that as well. But that, that's, that's, normally a destroyer comes alongside, how long would they be there? 15, 20 minutes? 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah. So could you tell me again, what was the oil on the back? What did you refer to it as? Black oil. Oh, just black oil. Okay. JP5. JP5, that's what I heard. Thank you. Yeah, that's JP5. JP5 there. Uh, tell us about going to port. And what, what ports did you go into? What Liberty ports did you go into when on these Westpac cruises? Let's see. You went to uh, uh, <clears throat> Subic Bay, uh, Sasebo, Japan, y Yakuska. We went to uh, Kaohsiung. We went to Hong Kong. We went to, uh, oh, Lord. Did you go to Australia? No, we wanted to go, but too many guys were married, they didn't want to go. <laughs> uh, we went to uh, Singapore. Oh, my goodness. Singapore. What he's talking about Subic Bay, there's a, uh, there's a town called Alangapo there. And it's one of the great big large naval bases uh, in the western Pacific and uh, there in the Philippines down from uh, from Manila. Sasebo, that's an old state, Yakuska, yeah. so that as well. And you went to Kaohsiung? Yep. Yeah. You're talking about in Taiwan. Yeah. Tell us about Liberty. How uh, did you have a, a three, uh, you have three Liberty sections? We had Three and so sometimes you get to go in town. If you if you days four days, you get to go in town three times. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you ever have port and starboard uh, duty? I've had port duty, starboard duty, fantail duty, <laughs> uh, delving duty, mm -hmm. missing the uh, bridge, and I've also the most made of the watch. To tell about a, a typical liberty in say Hong Kong. You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> you ever go to the Whitehead Club? No. Ride a rickshaw? 
<laughs> I'll tell you what I did go uh, to a good spot I can tell about. <laughs> the captain wanted to go to, uh, it was a restaurant, uh, I forgot the name of the restaurant, but uh, it's a floating restaurant. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So we had to go, uh, had to take the engineering officer with us so we could find out how to get there. And we finally found it. It was a nice place. You pull up to it, you know, and you, you dock, and the captain his guys go inside and eat, and you just stand outside the parade rest hall for an hour or two. But uh, that's about the best one. Yeah. The only thing I did in Hong Kong was going down to get a pair of tailor made boots and a sport coat. Tell, tell them about the uniforms with the dragon cuffs and stuff like this. I enjoyed them. Uh, they were non regulation. And uh, they would be spiked down here, which would aggravate the, the flare of the, uh, the and uh, all the sailors, but <clears throat> most of the sailors, they would have a set made. They would be their liberty uniform, but of course, a lot of them, they, they weren't regulation, so you couldn't wear them for inspection or wasn't supposed to, but some, some of them did anyway. But that's what he's talking about, and they had a uh, silk lining in the cuffs. But you usually had dragons or something like that. And how long did it take to get a, a, a uniform like that made? Were they? It, it, it in Hong long. Kong. It don't take long. 24 hours, 36 hours at the most. And what was interesting about this is that you would go ashore and you'd go into these uh, beer gardens, for lack of a word. The barmaids, they knew the ship moved better than you did. Well, matter of fact, if you go into port, they can tell you where you're going next before you even know it. That's right. Uh, did you ever deal with Mary Sue? Out of Hong Kong? No, she painted the whole ship for us. T tell us about what happened here. <clears throat> we had a lot of brass to get rid of. And so we went to Hong Kong to get it painted by this lady named Mary. And when she came on board with her helpers, and those helpers stripped down the clothes, they got rich on that ship. God, <laughs> oh my God! Boy, the women. You never see so many women painting the ship. Well, what she actually did. This was a, a, a woman in Hong Kong, and uh, she would come aboard and basically for scrap brass and sometimes even food stuff like that. She would actually paint the whole ship while you're in port. Mm. And she and, it, and all of her uh, the whole crew was women. Yeah. And they're yeah. sitting there, and you you see now that the paint may wash off, and then you know to a few days of sea, but it looked good for a while. <laughs> but uh, and what he probably what the brass was from firing from from uh, empty cases, ammunition empty cases, yeah, uh -huh. some that as well. But you had to be very careful because if you had a, 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 a brass uh, on the ship plates and stuff like that, you had to watch it very careful because they would disappear also. <laughs> so that is real. But that would be Mary Sue and her her, her, her group like that as well. If, if you look back at, the, at your time aboard a ship like the Tapa, was this the only ship you served on? Well, we'll say pretty much. Yeah. Uh, how, how would you view your time aboard the ship? <clears throat> well, the time was, uh, it was good times, except, you ever watched that movie four years ago? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to back up one. I'm going to tell you about Forrest Gump. The first trip we took on a Long Beach head for uh, the Philippines, we stopped off in Hawaii. After we left Hawaii, we had a typhoon. And the whole front of this ship, the swell was so big that the water would come across the top of the bow. And the water would hit about right here. <laughs> So at one time, you couldn't even see the front of the ship. It was all on the water. And once a day, <clears throat> on this catwalk, and so as I went down to the middle here, a guy would have to run when the waves were just right. He had to run up here, he cut this corner, and open this little door before the water could hit him. So you could make sure nothing broke loose up front. That's just an exciting day in a typhoon. And believe me, you will pray to God too. I'll tell you that. Were, were you uh, were, were you uh, fully loaded at the time of the typhoon, so you were sitting low in the water? Well, we, uh, one time we had to take our own some water. What are we talking about there? Because you're sitting so high, 
and the, and, you know, the ballast, so you take on water to actually increase the weight. Of that. So, yes? Is that why you were go opening the door was to, why, why did somebody run and open a door? We come up here and open the door to go inside to make sure nothing broke loose up in that hole and shit. Because everything is strapped down. Uh, that's all below deck as well as on deck there uh -huh. as well. And uh, it wasn't unusual to see in these typhoons that you actually see the, the, the steel superstructure of the ship would be bent. Uh -huh. I was in a typhoon in 1963 off of uh, Japan on a DE and the, the stern would actually come out of the water and then when it would go back down, it would catch. It was a single screw ship and it would catch and it would shake the whole ship. And you said, my God, this thing is not going to last. But we took over a 45 degree roll mm -hmm. in that as well. And, but, and we had actually damage to the superstructure. And I'm talking about the up, uh, up in this area up in here on the, on the DE from, from, the, uh, from the typhoon. And there's a little bit of amusement, using part to the thing is that we were supposed to get underway uh, in the afternoon well, because the typhoon was coming in and they decided that uh, the ships were better off riding out at sea as opposed to yeah. uh, hanging in port, see. So we got, we had what the night before called Cinderella Liberty. Had to be back by 12 o'clock. And we had a ship's party. That was our last night. In fact, I think it was Sasebo. That was our last night in uh, Japan on this particular ship. So, you know, you can imagine what condition sailors were at midnight when they all staggered back to the ship. Well, the next morning, about 4 or 5 o'clock, we were starting to get underway. Well, the crew still felt pretty good at that point. But by noon, when you're in the typhoon, there was a lot of sick sailors uh, uh, out there on that particular deal there as well. And I can, it was two or three days before I ate, and I can still remember the meal that I had, which was baked beans and cornbread. May have been the best food I ever had in my life. <laughs> so that as well. Tell us about it. Tell us about uh, uh, food on the on an order. <clears throat> uh, that's the best food it is. Everything's fresh except sometimes you may run out, but you got fresh eggs, fresh potatoes. Sometimes we even had lobster and steak and all kind of good stuff. Well, a lot better than I had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, did you have a uh, 24-hour kitchen? No, uh, in the galley. Only on uh, when yeah. ships kept coming along the side, then we have a 24-hour galley. You can, you know, eat anytime. It had mid wraps. Right. Midnight rations. Uh, that's when you have the shift. Uh, you see, uh, what the watch standards change? You know, from the eight o'clock to midnight. To and it, except on Sundays or either holidays, you can eat all day long. I'm sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. It's only brunch. Um, but from the standpoint of uh, the food itself, it's probably a lot better than those, except maybe the carriers that you uh, yeah. inside. Yeah. It was good food. Yeah, yeah, as well. So uh, tell us about your cruise there. You, you were telling me about that you got out at age 21? No, day before. Day before? Ex explain what, what, what your situation was. I was a kitty cruiser. What call it kitty cruiser? A kitty cruiser, a kitty cruiser gets out the Navy, the Navy before he turns 21. Mm -hmm. If you're 17 years old, that's called a kitty cruiser. I turned 17 on August the 23rd in 1965, and I joined the Navy on uh, August the 31st, 1965. So I joined, so I only served uh, uh, three years, 11 months, and so many days. And that's what we call the kitty cruiser. They, uh, they would get out at the day before they're 21 if they joined at 17, I guess. That wasn't, wasn't uncommon uh, in those days. You see, a city cruiser, he never gets, uh, he, he always gets old, but he, 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 he always stays young. Young in mind, yeah. but old in body. <laughs> when, you, when you served in your years of serving, what, 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 60? Five, Five to 67, 68, 69, 69. all right. Uh, did you experience any of the uh, anti-Vietnam uh, sentiment that was uh, pretty prevalent in those days? You mean from the people back home? Yeah. 
when you came back to when you came back when you homeported in San Diego? I can't talk about that. I can talk about anything with that. You know, seventeen years old and you go and you and when you fly back into an airport and people will spit on you and call your names and degrade you, that's not right. That's not right. I just can't talk about that point at all. Yeah. It was a tough time. <clears throat> Would you do it again? In a heartbeat. Yeah. In a heartbeat. Uh, but the only thing I'd, I'd do different when I come back to the airport, I'd have a, a baseball bat with me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are you in touch with any of you uh, whole crew members other than Jim Johnson? Uh, Dean Simmons, Stephen Chatley. Are they uh, down in South Carolina area? No, Dean's in Pennsylvania and uh, Steve Chatley's in Florida. And uh, we hope that you'll have an opportunity to talk to them about your visit up here. And if I am. And if they've got any memorabilia or something like that, you know a good place to um, donate it there as well. Does, do any of you have any other questions, observations, including a family? This is your chance. Yes? I have a question that might not be a smart one, but um, <laughs> I guess we still have oilers out at sea that still they, still they, do that? Okay. They got them. Okay. <laughs> but they are they are no longer they're they're no longer operated by the Navy. Is that right? They're the uh, if if you saw the, the dedication to the memorial Mm -hmm. We had uh, that fellow there from the Maritime Service. Uh, they now operate uh, those sort of ships, which I think is a mistake, but that's, you know, mm -hmm. no one asked me. Uh, Are they similar to, to that shape and Yeah, everything? pretty much. Pretty, pretty much, much the same. Uh, they, more, more modern, and uh, they're, they're a little larger, I think, probably. And think, so you see, what, what, and this is, this is one of the amazing things about, to me, when I started doing the research on this ship, was the fact that uh, from the time the keel was laid, and that's that <clears throat> rib that runs all the way along the bottom, till this ship was underway, six months. They built this ship in six months. And it was actually in a war zone in Nemea, New Caledonia, in nine months after the keel was laid. It was up here in Pennsylvania where the ship was made. And to me, that's, that's, that's the most amazing thing that I found about the ship, uh, uh, you know, is from the standpoint of how quickly it was built and how quickly it got out, uh, let's say, in New Mayo, in New Caledonia. So that as well. Got any other comments that you'd like to? Well, let me see. Post office. The second captain that we had, his name was Christensen, and he was he would be an arrow so bad. And uh, I believe that he would have been a real good one because he believed in being prepared. The second crew's over. He would uh, sound a, a general quarters. You got to get up and go shoot one of these guns at least ten times within so many minutes. And he believed in being ready, so we uh, and you up sleeping with your clothes on at night and your shoes, but you didn't want to be late. Did you, you ever spend Christmas at sea? Yes, sir. Tell us about Christmas at sea. Uh, well, you, well, just like any other time. We've, uh, like off the coast of Vietnam, it's, it's like 4th of July, every night just about, you can always see the napalm going off and the, the lights shots being shot and the, it's just, just, well, at Christmas time it's always real calm though. Yeah, uh, I, guess, I guess, you know, if you look back at there's a, there's a little bit of sadness to it though. Yes. Good, uh, for, the, for the sailor out there. Now, we, we were talking on the way over here about uh, his exposure to Agent Orange. Uh, the Navy came out with, actually the Veterans Administration Navy, they came out with a list of ships that they could say were exposed to uh, Agent Orange because they operated in the, like the, the Mekong River, the, uh, real close to the coast or something like that. Uh, the Tappahannock was not on that list, but perhaps you could explain what has happened now. They finally came into a 12-mile range. <clears throat> if you was in a 12-mile range, now you can declare for the age in orange. 
Well, we've always been within 12 miles. We've been, uh, one time a Vietnamese ship hit us and we had to go up into a little area where two rivers came together. So we had to drop anchors so they come out and inspect the ship. And, uh, and that was just was down uh, 200 yards of the land. So, but they said they didn't have any proof. But Mr. Johnson, that he was talking about earlier, he had the proof because he had all the logs on it. So he sent me a log sheet so I can use it so when I file. Which I filed, but they turned it down. And so I refiled with that. So uh, they accepted me just waiting on this 2020 to come around now. So they have the Blue Water Navy um, uh, 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 legal issue that was been resolved. Uh, so you were, you were actually anchored right off the coast. Right up where these two ships Where these two rivers around. come together. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, you got the agent iron exposure there. There's some concern too that uh, because these ships get, you know, they have uh, the, a lot of their water. Explain how, how you get your water on these things. Well, we got to take water from the ocean and just, you know, purify it. But, uh, you know, back then, what did they know about Agent Orange getting into the water? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How could they purify it? Yeah. And then even if you, uh, even if it gets in the ocean, you've always got a mist going across the ship, so. Like sometimes, uh, your first job would be to kick flying fish off the, off the ship, and they did. Well, I usually let it sit there and eat them later, but just get rid of them. What he's talking about is that uh, for neighborhood, for example, when they were sitting there and not uh, along with, for those two rivers toward uh, the ocean, the, the South China Sea, is that they were actually getting water out of the ocean and then purifying it. And what they were doing is basically removing the salt content from it. But there's some now concern that there was contaminants involved from the Agent Orange standpoint that weren't being removed when they, they, when they were being purified. So, so that is well. Uh, do you ever get hurt? Any, uh, while you re refueling? I guess the worst that got hurt was when uh, I was running the motor wheel boat, <clears throat> and when they went to, when I came alongside, and they went to pick me up, as they started picking the boat up, uh, they said stop for some reason. I don't know why, but they should have never said stop. Because as you're coming up, and the swell's coming up, and when he said stop, swell kept on coming to pick the boat up. And then when it dropped, mm -hmm. I fell forward and I blocked, broke my nose. Mm -hmm. But you didn't get a purple heart for that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that as well. Hey, talk a little bit about the just the day-to-day -day danger of serving aboard a ship like this, particularly when you're out there and you're handling lines day in and day and you're handling steel cables and you're in, in just the day-to-day just the -day danger involved. <clears throat> well, you... Uh, it was pretty much mental that everybody had to carry a knife in case you got cut. When you got caught in a rope, you could always cut it. Uh, the cable, if a cable would pop, uh, uh, you could either cut your head off or limb off. We had one guy on an anchor detail, uh, the rope popped and hit him below the eye, and his eyeball fell out, so they had to go put it back in. You know, anything could happen. And uh, the Japanese taught us a new lesson, though. Sometimes we'd... Uh, refuel a Japanese ship, but we really wasn't ready for the first Japanese ship because whenever we uh, shot the shot line on, a regular Navy guy, they pulled it slow. When the Japanese, they get in a big old circle and they run around and around and around and you're just burning your hands. You can't stop them. Really. <laughs> so uh, be careful with them. On the uh, DE I was on, they had a, kind of like a little, I guess you'd call it a flight deck. And uh, before you refuel, you had this we call it a stanchion, is a metal pole about this big around, it's about as high as it's seen, maybe not quite as high, but it's there. And when they first shot that small line over with a gun, and then they attach a larger one to that, and then they would attach the steel cable, well there was a, there was a bosun mate that had to climb up that steel pole, it had little steps on it, little, you know, and, and he would take, then there was a, a pulley up there and he'd have to put the uh, steel cable into that pulley and then that's the one that they would then use the rubber lines uh, rubber the rubber holes come across on the little pulleys as well well he climbed up there and he got his finger caught and between the steel cable and, and on, on that little pulley and 
pinch the end of it off. Just like that. <laughs> oh, no. Just like that. So he fell. He fell to the deck from up there. And I'm sitting there just not paying any mind to my own business for whatever reason. I still don't know why I did it. I climbed up that pole and finished hooking it up. Well, that was a mistake because I became my job from then on. <laughs> and so you're sitting up there and you're in rough seas and you're hanging onto that pole and you're rocking back and forth like this and you're just hoping that you can get that steel cable and get it into that uh, pulley thing, uh, it, you know, when it's not moving. So that, so that but that, that gives you an idea. Did, did you did you lose that? No, <laughs> not there, but I got it. But you, it off. but you know, he knows what we're talking about, because uh, especially the people on the deck that was handling all of this stuff day in and day out, those are the ones that were in the greatest danger. Uh, so that, yes, ma'am. You mentioned the swim call earlier. I, I, what is that? That's when they stop the ship and guys go swimming. Oh, just go swim and have fun? Yeah. Kind of? Uh, okay. I actually uh, had a swim call where the ocean was seven miles deep. <laughs> and uh, what they do, what he was talking about because of concern for sharks, they would have uh, one time, sometime two people up there with guns. And I, in fact, I, have, I was on a submarine. Uh, also, and uh, actually we did a swim call, and it was one of those things, the person, usually the person that ended up having to have the, uh, the M1, he didn't get swim call. So that was always kind of a, a concern for that as well. Now back to the swim call, you know, I said I always wanted to have one. Right. I never get to swim. You, you did not swim? Oh. Because see when those guys jumped off that ship, and they was floating way behind the ship, I had to follow in this little motor whale boat. I put some in the boat and had to throw ropes out for the other one so they wouldn't get too far away. So by the time all that was over, and when they came back, they, they turned the ship sideways so the water would, the current would come into the ship so they wouldn't, you know, float away. And after all that, I said, I don't even want to swim now. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the, the fellow with the, with the M1, he would, he would say, did I see a shark? And of course, all the sailors sitting there, they didn't want to jump in because they didn't know if he's joking or not. <laughs> well, we see all those guys floating beside my little boat. I said, if anybody hauled a shark, shoot them. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to sink. Did you all have mail call every day to get no, mail? Only when we go in port. <clears throat> but then when we go in port, we have our mail call. But when we left, we were also a mailman too, because we transferred letters to destroyers and all kinds of ships. So we were all mail carrier. We would carry live ammo and sometimes supplies. Okay. Mm. What's uh, what's the longest that you spent at sea without going into port? <clears throat> Do you have an idea? Probably about three weeks. About three weeks. Yeah. Um, There's a certain rhythm to being at sea. And uh, of course, you're standing. Uh, you know, you watch it every four hours, and usually yep. on, the, on the order, there's usually three duty sessions. And so, what actually happens? You never sleep the same time. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, between uh, reveille in the morning and uh, lights out at night, uh, you, you know, you may be off watch, but you're doing other duties. So your your time to sleep was going to be that, you might say, the dark hours. But, but, you know, for example, if you have, a, say you have the 12 to 4 watch in the afternoon, you're off for eight hours, so that means at midnight, you've got midnight to 4 o'clock. So you never really get into a routine, for sort a of regular sleep routine, something like this as well. And so, and, and then when you have, uh, say, say you're, uh, you know, you're off duty at uh, 8 to midnight, 2000 to 2400, something like that. But if you have a refueling, okay, you just miss your sleep because you've got to be up there and you've got to be part of that refueling at that particular time. And it's not what unusual, at least from my experience, that sometimes these refueling took took a, okay, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning. So you're sitting there, so you didn't <coughs> sleep begins. And I've seen a lot of times the sailors, the first thing they do when they get into port is take a nap. 
especially when they've been doing a lot of refueling and, and stuff like that as well. Somebody else had a question back here? David, David Jett, the curator of the museum, had two questions, and that was, what were your best times and what were your worst? And I know you've told us a lot, but what, I know he'd like an answer. My best time? Best and worst times. On the <clears throat> My worst time, uh, I was kind of young. Mm -hmm. And we had a helicopter come aboard to battle the ship to pick up something. And he had lowered this big old hook down. And I didn't know it because I was young. No, I guess you call it. Uh, and they said, grab the hook. And they yelled, they grabbed the hook. So when I caught the hook, that was my worst time. Oh. That thing hurt. Oh, my God. Could you imagine static electricity? Oh. Oh. Have you ever been walking across the car and touch something and get a little pop? That's 10,000 oh. times worse. That thing hurt. I'll never do it again. So that was at sea? Out at sea. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That was the worst time. What was the best time? The best time? Obviously, just not being with the, with the guys having fun. Yeah. That's the best time. Yeah. Having good comrades to go with, you know, party and sing songs. and Well, thank you for singing some good songs. I don't know. Uh, Tell us about payday. How did you get paid? Every two weeks. Why? You didn't get paid by, they didn't have direct deposits in those days. They paid cash. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a lockbox? <coughs> no, no, we didn't get money very long with that shit. No. <laughs> what, what would you spend it on? <laughs> and pork. Oh, oh and pork. <laughs> okay. I, I was thinking you were spending it on, gotcha. <laughs> well, there, there were, uh, there would be occasionally a uh, card game or a dice game. Well, it's always card game. But you can always get a, a money order and send it back home. Okay. All the married guys would send it to the wives or something. Okay. And then, then you had the uh, payday loan people. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> what percent? What we're talking about is that some sailors uh, had a, na a knack of uh, keeping their cash so they would loan it out to their other sailors for uh, just an exorbitant percentage. So you'd have a lot of these sailors lined up and they're, they're getting their paid in cash and you'd walk around a corner and you've got that guy standing there, you know, you know he wants his percentage or something like that. I served with a young fellow that uh, from, uh, from Michigan, and uh, he was very good at that, and he's still a mortgage banker today <laughs> on his own business. He got his start making money uh, like that as well. Five yeah. and seven, ten for fourteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Tell it mounts up when you get something in the hundreds, hundred for hundred forty. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Tell us about becoming a shellback. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. yes. Well, <clears throat> you, uh, Initiation. You got to start at one end of the ship and you got to roll your pants legs up. And you got to crawl on that wooden floor first with your nose touching the deck. Then you come to the steel deck and you got to crawl across it. And then you got to, there's, there's a certain area you got to go through, you got to go through a belt line. Oh where they just use these straps on you. When you go through the straps, you got to go through uh, the honey hole. That's a big chute. As you go through that chute, it's, they save garbage for about two or three weeks, you know. You got to crawl through it. But it's always best to be the first few guys to go through. Because after they get through, the rest of them is going through, throw up and all that. So when you get through that, uh, and when you get through that, you got to go see the... Uh, King Neptune. Uh, well, he's the last guy. Mm -hmm. You got to go see the, the princess, you got to kiss her foot. <laughs> and uh, the baby guy, you had to kiss his belly. And who else was? You had to see the royal dentist, the royal barber. And then King, uh, then was King Neptune, and he had one of those cow prods, and he says, I christened you to sail back. And when he touched him, if your nose came up off that deck, you had to uh, start over. Oh, no. So, but it hurt. Wow. But my nose wouldn't get up. No, I stayed there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I put my lips on that too to make sure it was stuck. <laughs> so did many people do the shell back? All of them. All, okay. And then what's mandatory. interesting is that, Oh, it was mandatory. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. What's interesting is that on that particular day, it wasn't just the, uh, the enlisted crew, the, the officers, who are also, they have to go through the same. On that day, there was no rate. No rate. Mm -hmm. Wow. No rate. 
So that would be the first time you could have a, uh, a seaman first class take a whack at the uh, Lieutenant JG uh, or a NIS. Yes, and the Lieutenant Commander's tears blow up. You got, you got it, you know. Yeah. Can't do nothing about it. And, and the realm of the Golden Dragon is the dividing line, the date line is uh, that you uh, cross like you're going west. <coughs> yeah. International date line. I think the now they would call that thing hazing, but that's not hazing, that's just, uh, I'd go through it again. If, if, I, if I wasn't one, I'd go through it just to be one, mm -hmm. even though it hurt and it was uh, <laughs> sickening though, but mm -hmm. I'd still go through it. Yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about, talking about a shell back, uh, that's what, what the initiation is. So I'm going to uh, get my daughter to run a copy of my shell back certificate and send it to you. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the dragon thing, the golden dragon, and send that to you. Yeah, That's cool. Just don't put bras on the mermaids at all. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, observations? What about the family? This is your chance to ask him a question you've been wanting to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Anything thank, first of all, thank you for, for, for making this trip up oh, here for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> And so what we he, he brought his cruise book and uh, going to present it to the museum for perpetuity and we'll get you to sign a little form here where to give it to us and that sort of thing. But thank you very much. Okay. Thank you as well as well. And we'll uh, do this as well. Thank you. Look around here at Howard. Thanks to you on this. We, we, we talked a little bit about the history as we were walking down to the memorial while we and I sort of give a short history class. But this is a, a history of Essex County, Virginia. That, and it, it heals, uh, tells you everything that I didn't tell you <laughs> on, on the way up here as well. But uh, thank you. Thank you for well, I appreciate that. As well. i tell you a little bit about where the... the the ship's name came from and, and all of that sort of stuff. Very good.